All right, let's go ahead and get started. So good evening and thank you all for joining us tonight for our first Family Academy of the 2024 uh, in 2024. My name is Ronnie Shoa and I am the Supervisor of Communications and Engagement with WJCC Schools. On this call, we also have Ms. Courtney Hoffpower, who is our WJCC Schools Family and Community Engagement Specialist. Um, she will be monitoring our Q&A during tonight's presentation. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, just be, feel free to use the Q&A feature in the Zoom, um, and we'll have some time to address those questions at the end of the presentation. So tonight we have Mr. Jordan Staley here, a current WJCC Schools music and band teacher and a Gr Grammy Music Educator Award nominee. In addition to teaching, Jordan, Jordan has worked with the Virginia Department of Education on several fine arts education development teams, standards review committees, and professional development design. Jordan is the conductor of the Williamsburg Youth Orchestra's wind ensemble and concert bands, and also teaches in the early childhood music school right here in Williamsburg. As if that's not enough, Jordan is also a specialist in the United States Army playing tuba in the 380th Army Reserve Band stationed at Fort Eustis. Um, that's quite, quite a lot of work, so I'm thankful that we had some time that he can squeeze in tonight um, to, to talk with us. Um, so with that, I will pass it off to Jordan and um, let's get started. Well, th thank you so much. And thanks for uh, uh, making this happen. I'm really excited that our school system uh, wants to do a family academy on supporting emerging musicians, which is really awesome. So thank you for your work in making this uh, making this happen. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I like to play music and it, it's done well for me. And, and the starving musician thing doesn't have to be the only narrative around making music in schools. And that's a really awesome thing. Tonight, our, our main focus uh, is to to try to give some tips and hints on how to uh, support your emerging musician, how to uh, what what helps them practice at home, what motivates students to practice, and maybe what doesn't. I've been teaching in public schools for eleven years now. I've seen a I've been fortunate enough to be a part of a lot of uh, students' journeys into beginning band um, and beginning orchestra. And so I've seen what works and and how how sometimes that can help students excel and find something they didn't know they love find out they love it. And I think I've seen a few times when it doesn't work. So hopefully we'll uh, come up with some good tips. Um, but music making has been a part of my life for, for a really long time. I met my wife uh, in school music programs in elementary school all the way to high school. And I've got two kids in the school system now. One is in fourth grade, about to go uh, pick his beginning band instrument for fifth grade. And my daughter's in first grade. So uh, getting them to practice at home is a struggle I'm I'm well aware of uh, and, and totally understand. But uh, they're both extremely passionate musicians right now, and I can't wait to see what happens next for them. All right. So uh, like I said, really, the, the big goal today, uh, the agenda items are um, to go over the five sections here. And if I don't quite make it to the end, the resource page at the end has all of the awesome the, the awesome links to, to use. Um, but it's really the goal is to empower you to know how uh, effort and support go hand in hand. And sometimes it's the difference between what students decide to do with their instruments long term. Uh, we'll briefly discuss the reason why we even have music in our schools in the big why section uh, with some pro tips on goal setting and intentional practice. The what do I need section will touch on the essentials for effective practice at home. The list is pretty short, but it's really, really important to actually creating the environment students use to get to catch that practice bug on their own. The what am I listening to slash four section uh, and includes an embarrassing video of me. So that'll be fun. Uh, it'll be my best attempt at being a beginner player and then magically transforming into a better player just with some small adjustments. The transformation didn't come across quite as magically as I had hoped, but it's still still a, a worthy endeavor here. So we'll, we'll give it a watch. The how do I help section of this presentation is the part that I'm least proficient at. I'll, I'll give you that much up front here uh, because it's also my biggest struggle as a dad. Uh, trying to balance life and practice is really, really hard, but I'll give you some real world ideas that other people who are really good at this uh, talk about, and maybe maybe I'll, I'll learn something uh, about how to balance that better myself. Um, it's not a make you feel bad about being busy section. It's it's the reality of life, uh, mine included, and how we can do a better job of managing that with, with the practice expectation. And lastly, we'll finish up with the most important part. Like I said before, it's those links. Uh, that's really the, the part that I think you want to uh, smash that like button and hit subscribe. No, just kidding. This isn't a YouTube channel. We're, we're good. We'll, we'll just keep going. All right, let's jump into it. The big why. 
Why do we even have music in our schools? Not every student takes band or strings and learning a new is- instrument really isn't a life or death situation. And and uh, that starving musician uh, trend is, is really something that that's out there. But obviously music in our schools is important. It's it's what creates the learning environment in the community in which, in which we send our students to school. And uh, we, we are really blessed to be in a community, community that values the arts. I mean, the fact that we're having a, a parent uh, academy on, a family academy on, on the arts is, is uh, part and parcel to that. So we're going to dig into some of the impacts music education has on students and, and what they can gain, those 21st century job skills we're always talking about, and why music is, the, is one avenue that really helps students excel in that sort of world. And how learning a new instrument has impacts that go way beyond the classroom. All right. So this graphic is has a lot of stuff going on, but each of those little blurbs uh, comes from peer-reviewed research uh, that's been replicated decade over decade. So these aren't just like things that people hit points out of. Uh, these these are real impacts music education has on students. Uh, it's especially magic at the elementary age, and we know that those impacts have long-lasting brain developmental impacts later on in life. So these are just some of the highlights from some academic journals uh, that uh, have come out in the last decade or so. So when we learn a new instrument, we strengthen the neural pathways that connect parts of our brain we associate with impulse control. Uh, so if we think of the learning process as a timeline, success uh, isn't really something that plateaus for musicians. We don't ever really master a skill. We always have to keep working on getting better at something. There's no real finished skill in a music in the music world. So when I work with my middle school musicians in the WIO, that's one of the very first things we have to talk about because the challenge of a piece isn't how fast the notes are going across the page or uh, how challenging some of the rhythms are. Really the challenge in, in a piece of music is how beautifully, passionate, and perfectly we can play each note. That attention to detail, that detail orientation is a control uh, that that is not Easy to make, easy to develop in other settings, but in the music world, I mean, it's either 100% right and getting better, or it's just wrong, and that's that's a lot of impulse control we're working on every time we we come in. In math, it's either right or wrong, black or white. In literature, there's really only one main idea, especially if you're trying to fill in a bubble sheet. Uh, so in music, it's really not that way. Every passage can can either be right-ish or wrong, and we're never really ready for a concert. So there's always something to be working on. And that growth mindset is uh, is all about grit, all about decision-making, and all about creative thinking every time we get our instruments out. And the ability to connect our fine motor systems with our respiratory system, with our short-term memory, and with so many other parts of our brain, has those neural pathways simply buzzing every time we play an instrument. We know that the parts of our brain that light up like Christmas trees when we play instruments uh, are the parts that our brain doesn't want to shed whenever we shed our neural pathways as we get older. So the more we have students playing musical instruments, the more neural pathways are firing in our brains. And that's just strengthening uh, parts of our brains that hopefully we won't lose whenever we get older. It's it's really, uh, the research is really interesting there. I've never met a person who says, man, I'm, I'm so happy I stopped playing my instrument. I meet people all the time who say things like, oh man, I, I used to play the trumpet. I, I wish I still did. It's so much fun. Uh, they stop for one reason or another, and there's lots of really good reasons to stop playing your instrument. But if we can encourage our students to to k- stick with it and keep playing their instrument, they'll they'll be one of the people I get to meet that says, "Man, I I still play my trumpet every now and again. I play trumpet at, at my church. Or I play trumpet in the community band, and uh, that that's awesome." We're not looking to make professional musicians. We know that there are real uh, uh, researched benefits to learning a new instrument, especially in elementary school, all the way up through high school. All right, so let's 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 talk about the big why. And we've got goal setting, intentional listening, intentional practice, and finding our impact. Goal setting, uh, we'll, we'll get into this in a second, but the smaller we start our goals, the more achievable our goals are, the bigger the impacts they have whenever we meet them. Intentional listening and intentional practice, those are kind of mindfulness traits that we'll, we'll dive into more. Um, and then finding your impact could have one of two two views to it. Finding your impact could be a student's uh, ability to find their impact on how they play their instrument for other people, or what it what it feels like whenever they practice and come prepared for our class, or it could be our our impact on their practice. And that's the lens we're going to go with tonight. Uh, so we impact our students in practicing with the words we say, the uh, the faces we make whenever they get out their recorders. All of that impact we have is uh, sometimes helpful and sometimes not so helpful. So we'll hopefully we'll 
dive into some helpful versions of that. All right, so we'll start with smart goals. Uh, smart goals are I'm a I, I have 450 students at my school, and when I have to do smart goals every year, uh, so that my principal can have measurable growth and can see measurable growth over time. And they're awesome if uh, I get to make them. If they're if they're if I'm told what my smart goal is, they mean less to me. Our goal with smart goals, whenever students are practicing, is that they create them, and then they can meet them feeling good about it and build up that intrinsic motivation. Uh, the S for smart goals means specific. And, and for a brass player, it could be a buzz goal. Can I buzz through a passage or can I buzz along to a favorite song on the radio? Um, it can be really specific with maybe it's a, a number in a book. I want to play number five today until it sounds really, really good. It can be a listening goal. I want to uh, go to YouTube and listen to uh, some incredible trombone player and then have his characteristic tone in my head when I play number five from the book. But that the more specific it is, the more achievable it is. We really want those uh, SMART goals to start specific, especially for students. The measurable part of a SMART goal for a student, and, and we can help them prepare these goals, are things like, uh, those are the tools in which we we can measure our success. So, so if recording it and then playing it back is the sort of measurable aspect of, of a SMART goal whenever kids are practicing. The attainability are things... Uh, that students immediately see whenever they come to a class. So if they've practiced the day before or they practiced a week and they come into class and can say, hey, Mr. Staley, I not only can I play number five, I can play number five from memory, or I can play number five uh, with all of my notes growing from one to the next or playing with, with this sort of style. Uh, th that attainability comes when they can show off for the skill that they've worked on. The relevancy of a SMART goal, and especially whenever it comes to practicing for kids, is just like with the attainability, but it's it's whenever they play it in front of other people, like that confidence at the concert. Uh, and then timeliness is another important thing. We'll talk about this whenever we get to the very last section here, uh, but practicing doesn't have to be a 45 minute struggle. It can be a five, 10 minute goal. The real challenging thing is to think, what does my practice today look like? And how does it benefit me a year from now, or maybe even five years from now? That's a hard thing to get to, especially whenever we're talking to fifth graders uh, or even middle schoolers. But it's something to think about. I mean, uh, what we this time I invest on my tuba now is going to pay off. It might not be tomorrow, and it might not be uh, even a year from now, but five years from now, whenever I can still play that fundamental tone, that's because of the practice I put in uh, today or yesterday. All right, this is this is uh, this is an important part here because intentional listening is the active, present, and focused participation in practice. My wife is way smarter than me, and she listens to really smart people on podcasts and reads smart books and looks up smart stuff on the internet. I play tuba. Sometimes I get lucky and can add stuff to the things she's talking about. And recently she was talking to, me, talking to me about polygots, or those are the people who can speak multiple languages fluently and how they learn so many new languages. She relayed a story on how she heard that... Uh, people who are researching polygots, some, some polygots like to read books that they already know, but in a different language. Some like to watch television shows in new languages. Some like to learn a few small phrases and then engage in a dialogue with native speakers, weaving their own small phrases into longer phrases. Some read through dictionaries and memorize stuff, but all have intentionality in common and all do what they, they all learn a new language intentionally. And that's something we do whenever we practice. I was able to contribute to the conversation. Whenever we're practicing, we do it with intentionality. We don't just go and play whatever we want to. We have to do it uh, with, with a characteristic tone in mind, with the ability to recognize what we're playing in mind, getting better each time we play and playing with a supported sound. That embarrassing video will, will go over all this uh, and you'll be able to see exactly what this could look like at home. Intentional listening is slow, it's active, and it's very present. It's something we want our students to be doing on their own, but it's a skill that requires scaffolding. So in the beginning, we should we should be the ones helping them intentionally listen to themselves. We do that um, by adding natural stopping points in practice and asking your student, your emerging musicians questions like, is your sound characteristic? Do you recognize what you're playing? Or do you think it's getting any better? Or maybe is your sound supported? Those are some ways that we can have open-ended questions, and we'll talk more about some open-ended question stems to get them thinking critically of themselves so that they can be the ones intentionally listening to their own practice sessions. But again, this is a skill that we need to demonstrate for them so we can build that skill on their own. All right, so I used to practice my trumpet. I have four brothers I used to practice in the basement at my house. 
And uh, my mom, who's a tried and tested band mom, used to shout down uh, downstairs and be like, hey, Jordan, you I haven't heard you practice your trumpet in four or five minutes. What's going on? And I, I, you know, smart kid over here. I'd be like, oh, I'm counting my multiple rests. I'm just just counting rests, mom. She was intentionally listening to what I was doing and understood that maybe counting rest wasn't a good use of my practice time. Efficient practice isn't really just sitting and counting rests. It's taking a very small chunk of music and getting that chunk better. So your intentional intentional listening to a practice session is huge in their development and understanding of what they can get away with and what actually counts as practice for themselves. And therefore, because of what you what you said counts and what doesn't count. Intentional practice. Oh, man. It's, again, it's a skill we want students to do on their own, but it's a skill that requires practice. And the scaffolding comes from what we provide them. Uh, so be specific with your feedback. Be supportive. And then this is the tricky one. Allow space for answers. Uh, so intentional practice is the idea that we slow the process down. We get really picky about our sound. And we fix small mistakes at the micro level in order to ensure we don't make that same mistake twice. We need that feedback loop to be solution oriented so that we can stay motivated and keep practicing at that super picky micro level. Detail oriented practice can feel like it takes forever. However, if we think about how we also need to practice efficiently, then the time we take adding notes to our music so we don't make the same mistake twice really does speed up our practice time. The trouble with mindlessly practicing or running through a bunch of songs super quickly is that we strengthen the neural pathways that allow mistakes to happen. We don't want those neural pathways strengthened. We want our, our super picky practice to make everything better each time. You've probably heard the phrase that practice makes uh, better or perfect practice makes perfect. Really, it's practice makes permanent. So if we slow it down to the micro level, we're, we're cementing the things that, that are correct and make it easier for us to build a foundation to learn new things. If we're letting slips and mistakes go by without stopping to correct them, really not making any progress. If you look closely at the practice stems, you can try to add to your conversations. You'll notice that they're all very open-ended, no yes or no's kind of, kind of a deal. That helps them be active in their practice and be solution-oriented on what they wanna do and how they can fix it. Really amazing jazz musicians start almost every interview with an homage to the people who inspired their sound, their musical ideas, and their musical voice. Those jazz musicians are super intentional with who they listen to and the sound concepts they use to play. They do that in their intentional practice too. So we can model that for them, for our students, by finding those practice stems and encouraging dialogue whenever we hear them practicing instead of just letting bad stuff continue. So finding your impact. I know before kids start walking through the hallways in August, the schools get filled with new teaching materials that teachers are going to be using in that school year. Well, a couple of years ago, a couple of new boxes started coming up in the hallways and they had names on them like writing without tears or reading without tears. I was, I mean, I was pretty funny, right? What a concept. We don't want kids to be crying when they're writing. We don't want kids to be reading and crying at the same time. Well, we don't want students to be crying and practicing either. Sometimes if we get to the point where they're so emotionally invested or emotionally divested that they just want to disconnect from their instrument, it's really hard to build that back up again. So uh, let's, let's talk about some ideas. Parents and guardians are always walking that thin line on which battles to fight and which battles to just let go by. And that struggle is that we think we know what's best for our kids and our kids think they know what's best for themselves. Sometimes those visions don't really align and that struggle is real. Practicing is something that is not immediately going to give someone joy. I'm fortunate enough to know that progress takes time and effort, and that effort I'm putting into the process is what pays off. But that long-term thinking is really abstract, especially for young musicians. Telling a fifth grader that practicing now, even though it's not fun, pays off when you're in high school is completely irrelevant to their life. However, suggesting a break from the thing that is frustrating them at the moment and playing something else that's fun, easy, is also really helpful uh, to, to disconnect, but keeps them on their instrument and keep them, keep them playing. So at that resource page at the end of this, you're going to see fun things like lo-fi long tones. They're fun to play along. They're easy to play along, but it's a great tool to keep students playing with that supported sound, which is fundamental to what they're doing. It helps them play in tune, and they're really easy and fun to play. 
we use things like that with our with pop songs at Matthew Whaley and other other schools in our district too, uh, and it works well with my daughter. I mean, she loves playing Taylor Swift on her keyboard or a little like three string guitar she has. But if I say, "Hey, you're practicing," well, then then that that out the window it goes. We want to make sure what they're doing on their instrument is fun and relevant to themselves. We may know the long term, but that's not important. What they're doing now is fun, and that's that's really the most important part. So this is the list of resources that I used to create that first infographic with all those uh, those six different blurbs there, and there's some uh, great research in here. If you want to, if you got curious about any of it and want to do more, uh, those clicks to those academic journals are, are right there. All right, so the what do I need section. We made it through the big why. We're all on board with why music's important, and and you all want your musicians to succeed, and that's all awesome, and great, super cool, but. Now we want the concrete black and white list of actual things we need in place for our students to succeed. And it's easier than you think. It requires less than you think. And uh, it's really important. It's 80% of the struggle, in my personal opinion. So this analogy may or may not stick. Uh, I said it to my wife the other day, and she's like, eh, maybe it's not your best analogy, but we're going to go for it anyway. Pretend it's like this. Two hockey players, right? One is in Canada, and one is down in Williamsburg, Virginia. The Canadian hockey player can go out in his backyard and play hockey on the rink that he has in his backyard right after school, no problem. The American hockey player has to go all the way down to uh, Yorktown and find the rink at the open hours in order to get that same practice in. They, If all things are equal, if they come at hockey with the exact same skill level, the one who has access is going to practice and get better than the one who has a barrier to that access. What do I need section on this, of this uh, talk is going to talk about how we can break down those barriers to access and get our students to easily access uh, their practicing time and it increases how much time they can put on the instrument and therefore get better. It's all about creating a fun environment. So let's get at it. First of all, a place to practice. The, the really big ideas are a place to practice and support, but uh, practice spaces are really important to be secure enough for your student to leave your instrument out. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second here. But if you can keep your instrument out of its case, that's one less barrier to practice. One less thing that has to happen before practicing can start. Having a secure place to keep an instrument out of the case is made easier with an instrument stand, but it's not required. Certainly helpful, not required though. It seems obvious, but even the chair they're sitting in has an important role in their practice space. If we want them to be sitting with good posture, we need a chair that doesn't have arms and is not super cushy, so they sit down and slouch. Uh, no matter what instrument they're playing, a good solid chair with no armrests is, is a huge, like one less thing that you gotta worry about in their practicing space. The last physical element that aids in creating a process, uh, a space for, for success is a stand and a mirror. If we empower students with a, with a mirror to be their own check for their own posture, that's one less thing that we need to do and one more element of intention that they can add to their, their practicing. Uh, a stand is also one more way for them to support their sound without us having to be like, oh, where's your music supposed to go? Um, last uh, is the support idea. And support from family is one of the biggest indicators for success on a new instrument. I mean, we see hundreds of kids start instruments each year and the ones that stick through it aren't the ones who are the most talented, aren't the ones who uh, have everything in place. The most of the time it's the ones who have someone that they get to impress on their instrument. Their biggest fans are their families. And if you can be the their biggest fan each week, every time stuff happens, even if life gets busy, that biggest fan, you're you're ninety percent, ninety nine percent of the time, the the people your kid wants to impress the most on their instrument, is you. All right, uh, let's make this happen. All right, so the physical space element here. I have a nephew uh, who is up in Fairfax, and he's a tuba player. And uh, his sister, my niece, is a, a string bass player. So my brother had to buy a special car just to transport their instruments. I'm not really sorry about that. I think it's hilarious. But either way, they uh, get instrument stands like that tuba stand back there is was what we give what I give them uh, whenever they pick their instruments out as my nephews or nieces because I know how valuable it is. They're both incredible uh, hockey players and lacrosse players. And practicing is so hard to fit into their schedule. But if their tuba is just sitting out, they're way more likely just to pick it up and play. Even those big instruments. I mean, the bigger the instrument, the more important the stand is because it takes forever to get it out. Now, we talked about a secure space for uh, a place for your student to practice. That's because really leaving your instrument out of its case so you can just pick it up and play is is really, really helpful in, in setting up that physical environment for them to be able to practice in. 
And now it can be scary if you have cats or dogs or little brothers, or little sisters, you're going to run through the space and want to play with it too. But I think if we get creative with how we're setting up our, our spaces, like maybe it's just a corner in the dining room that, uh, has a, an instrument stand for their clarinet and they can pull the dining room chair out and they're ready to play. It might not be the most appealing whenever you have friends and family over, you can put it away, but it, when it's time for them to come home from school, throw their backpack down and, and their instruments already assembled, ready for them to play 80% more likely to play than if they have to get it out of its case and put a mouthpiece together. Having that designated area for practice free from distractions and part of a routine can dramatically increase the likelihood of practice at home. So this, this chair has no arms. Uh, it's, it's hard. And there's a stand with a book on it. I'm way more likely to explore it. And this is, I mean, this is my space right here with that instrument case. That link is for a DIY instrument stand. If you could look them up on YouTube, they're really easy. People take cardboard and tape and they can make an instrument stand. So you don't have to go out and buy an instrument stand. I mean, that's a long-term solution that might be worth investing in. But if you're looking for something quick right now, you can make a make a DIY instrument stand out of some cardboard and tape. Um, super, super important for how they set themselves up with posture. The last element, like we said before, 99% of the time, the people students want to impress most on their instrument are their families. One of the ways you can be that biggest fan for them, even if what they're playing isn't sounding amazing, is with some of these sentence stems. Like, man, I love hearing you play. That's amazing. Or let's record that song and send it to grandma. Or you sound so much better. I bet you you can audition for district band or maybe the WIO, Williamsburg Youth Orchestra, which is a great organization too. Maybe you're getting so much better each and every day. Or I'm so proud of you and your progress. Wow, did you just play number five in the book from memory? Any sort of creative way we can be like, oh man, what you're doing is really cool is going to encourage them to just keep practicing. And I mean, that's obvious, but it's probably worth saying. All right, so this is the one of my listening to section. We talked about all the, the abstract ideas, but whenever it comes down to it, they have a place to practice. We know it's important. Well, what are we supposed to be listening to? If you're not a musician, you can still be a huge step in their musical progress without any other formal training. Uh, because some of it is pretty obvious, pretty self-explanatory. And I think this video might help. What we're really looking for is characteristic tone, which means the tone that they're playing out of their instrument is the tone you would expect that instrument to sound like. One of the best things you can do is have them listen to that instrument by a professional. So YouTube is a huge uh, resource uh, to be like, hey, why don't we look up famous trumpet players or famous trombone players, or you can ask your, your band or strings teacher to send you some links as well. And they will give you that characteristic tone, that understanding of what your instrument is supposed to sound like. Cause then all you have to do is match that sound. A supported sound is a sound that's not going to be all hunched over and not full. A supported sound is very full and that you know exactly when the sound starts and when it stops. Improvement each repetition, that's that intentional practice. Are they intentionally doing what they're doing? Or are they just blowing through notes trying to add time to their uh, to their practice log? Slow practice, intentional practice. Say, slam, and play is the secret recipe we use in band. And that idea is when you come across a new piece of music or things are getting frustrated, you break it down. You say the note names, you slam the note names. So you slam by... by uh, saying the note names while, while adding the fingerings or the slide position or the, the frets, and then you play it. But all of it comes down to attention to detail. So what you're about to see is, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just play it. The only thing I want you to think about while you're listening to this is characteristic tone, supported sound, improvement each repetition, slow practice and attention to detail. So you're going to see me be my be my uh, my uh, support system here in the very beginning. Am I playing with those ideas? And then what do I do to change it in the back? All right, here it goes. This is this is this is rather embarrassing, but it's for a good cause.
All right. So uh, that magical transformation may not have been as magical as I was hoping for, but you know, yeah, it was a, it was a video either way we're listening. Did, did, was the tone more supported the second time I was sitting up taller. I had better posture. I set myself up for success that time. You don't have to be a musician to see a kid slouching. If your student is slouching at home, be like, Hey man, I know that musicians sit up tall. Can you show me how to sit up tall. Great. Or if their sound isn't coming across the way that a characteristic tone would sound, probably mostly uh, involves support. So you can videotape that sound and, and have them listen back and say, what would you change if you were uh, the band director or if you were the strings director, what would you change about the sound here? And I bet you that, I bet you they have some great ideas. Uh, improvement each time. That's one thing that I think would really help a lot of students, uh, especially early on. Being able to play it is great, awesome. You've got notes on the right page and it sounds like the song you want to sound like, great. Take it to the next level. How do you improve it from one take to the next take? What's something musical that you can add? Maybe dynamics or, or volume of the song. Does it sound small at the beginning, big in the middle, back to small at the end? Or should it sound something different? But not being satisfied with just having the right notes at the right time is that sort of grit and attention to detail that is has our neural connections firing on all cylinders. Slow practice. Slow practice is something that is a scaffold skill and it uh, builds intrinsic motivation, but it has to happen externally. Someone outside of their, their own practice session has to be like, stop, whoa, good job. I bet you, you can do it better though. Could you go back and try just that first half one more time for me? Or maybe just the, the second half uh, to the end. I, I just love to hear it a couple more times. We have this trick uh, that we use sometimes where you have a row of pennies on your music stand. You move all the pennies to the left. You pick a four bar phrase or maybe one exercise from the book. Every time you play it perfectly, you slide one penny to the other side of your stand. And you do that until all the pennies are on the other side of the stand and you win. However, if at any point in any of those repetitions, you crack a note or you play something wrong, every one of those pennies you've earned goes back to the beginning and you start again from the beginning. Not a super fun game, especially if it's only pennies, but maybe you play it with Skittles or maybe you play with M&Ms. I don't know. Could be more fun. Definitely something to try. So we, we've got a, a good idea of what it could look like to practice and what our rule when, when our students are practicing might be. This last section is, is the section I told you I, I'm the least confident in because it's something I struggle with too. And it's that management of time. Uh, what is a realistic expectation uh, for practicing? Well, it is not a time, it's not a specific amount of time each day that has to happen. I used to think early in my career that students practicing 20 minutes a day was the right answer. Uh, my daughter's in first grade, but the research says that if you read with your kids for 20 minutes a day, they're going to become better readers or something like that. Uh, our library, our public library has the incredible program where they help your student, uh, your preschool student read. I think it's like a, a, a thousand books or something like that before kindergarten. Super awesome. There's not a special, special time, however, for practicing at home because the efficiency in which you practice matters more than the time you put on that time, uh, that practice log. So setting expectations, I think is one thing that would help. Uh, but one of the things that helps my family right now is that if we don't if we don't set um, if if we look realistically at our calendar, so some days Tuesdays are really bad for us. We've got too much stuff going on, so Tuesdays are kind of a wash. So we kind of we we bank our time on other days. So Wednesdays are more open for us. So we'll practice extra on Wednesday Wednesdays to make up for the time we didn't have on Tuesdays. Another thing that I've seen help my students is. Uh, uh, at Matthew Whaley, we have a kind of a later start time. It's not until students don't come to school until 928, which gives the morning uh, as a possible practice time or a practice slot. So some students like to practice before their bus gets there. And that's a great idea too. But setting up practice and homework schedules help things get done. And I think if we add practicing as one of our essential essential building blocks of our of our week, we'll have more practice time. Putting that mirror on the wall activates the intentionality of, of them of students checking their own selves for, for posture and active listening to practice is really important. Remember, as parents or, or as guardians, we're going to look for tension and sound. So if, if you're seeing your students start to have shoulders creep up or uh, maybe their instrument, you're, they're kind of huddling into their instrument rather than letting the instrument come to them, then that's another point or a checkpoint where we can say, hey, Remember, tension is the enemy. Can you sit up tall, relax your, relax your body, and bring your instrument to you? Uh, 
recording and reviewing is a, a huge step forward that is so accessible now with cell phones, right? So recording your student practicing and then letting them play it back doubles the amount of practice time because listening to their own sound is going to help them play better next time. So you can, sometimes it might be easier to have them practice for five minutes a piece, record that practice time. And on your way to soccer, you can play that video in the car and count 10 minutes of practice. It's a simplistic idea, but we know that uh, intentionally listening and looking for mistakes is going to make us better players anyway. So use that time in the car from one activity to the next activity as practice time. I think that's a, a cool idea I heard someone up in New Kent talk about with their students traveling all the way down to Williamsburg Youth Orchestra on Monday nights. They would record their practice session on Sunday and play that session all the way down uh, on Monday night and double their practice time. It's a great idea. All right. So like we talked about before, tension is really not a great idea. So there's a, a couple of buddies of mine up in the Pershing zone. Uh, military has amazing bands and, and groups that have uh, incredible resources online and their YouTube channels have great tutorials and videos for your students to be watching. And there's a link to that later on. But one of the things that she was talking about in this video is all about posture. And if you look at the, her shoulders in this first picture right here, you'll see that she's hunched over and she's bringing that trumpet to herself. Rather than in the second video, she sets herself up for success by sitting tall and the trumpet comes to her. So instruments brought to the student, not leaning in, and mirrors can be that check that they use to say, hey, what are, what are my shoulders doing right now while I'm playing? All right. This is the one that's kind of the pot calling the kettle black here because I, I don't do this very well right now. But looking for a consistent time to practice each day, uh, so before school or right after getting dropped off the bus, that's that's going to lead to success. Like we talked about before, time on horn is important. You can bank time from a busy day to a less busy day, and that still counts. And finding your free time in the week might be a great chance for you to try different ways to practice. So maybe uh, Tuesday is um, fundamentals day. Wednesday is YouTube day, and you play along with YouTube tracks. Thursday is your buddy comes over after school, and you get to play duets with him. Short, focused practice is the most effective type of practice. A full 45-minute chunk is hard, right? Um, but breaking it into like a five-minute, you got five minutes, go do something effective on your horn. Intentionally get your horn out and play through just a warm-up routine for five minutes and, and then come back downstairs and we'll eat dinner. Or uh, practicing with friends also, I mean, it's fun. You get to hang out with your buddy and it counts towards practice. And recording your practice sessions, like we talked about before, is a huge intrinsic motivator because you get to hear your sound and be like, all right, I have I have one idea on how I can make that sound better. And I'm going to try it next time I get to next time I get to practice. All right. Now, this is this is the, this is the important part. This is the link part here. So a lot of these links, I just put I just straight up put the YouTube channel on it because uh, with everything, it's always best to have a parent around or a guardian around whenever you have your students looking through stuff. But some of these videos are really, really great tools and resources that you can be using at home. And with that intentional practice that you're you're demonstrating and modeling for them, you'll hear exactly what they're practicing and, and be able to suggest a different idea. There's also groups in our town, which is where we live in a really awesome place for, for a beginning musician. Like I said before, we've got the Williamsburg Youth Orchestra, but there's also the Williamsburg Symphony Orchestra. We talked about how important it is to go hear live music. Well, we have an entire symphony orchestra in our town. It's definitely worth checking out. Flute Frenzy, if your student's a flute player, they have uh, an incredible Flute Frenzy beginner flute program. The Williamsburg Choral Guild, if you've got a singer in your family. The Chamber Music Society of Williamsburg is a great place to go check out uh, amazing musicians. They go right to our library. Uh, the Williamsburg Youth Harp Society, another incredible outlet and resource. And, and of course, private lessons. Sometimes that intrinsic motivation is hard to develop and all the tools in the world might not help your student get any or de develop that intrinsic motivation on their own, but an external uh, private lesson instructor could be the key or one of the keys, one of the tools that they use to get better in their journey. If you need more information on that, definitely reach out to your directors. They'll give you all the vetted information that you uh, would need for that. These links are awesome. Uh, so our pandemic uh, teaching experience led to a creation of, of really awesome tools that students can access, uh, like practice challenge videos with the U.S. Marine Band or the U.S. Army YouTube page that has great tutorials for every instrument and are awesome. I mean, the, the quality of both those videos uh, are, are really great. The Easy Music Lesson YouTube page uh, has pop songs that are really fun to play along with. 
and have like lo-fi long tone pop tunes. Dr. Selfridge has a live stream band that you can join every Sunday. He also has a ton of free resources that we use. Uh, so if a student comes to me and says, hey, Mr. Ted, I want to I learn some Harry Potter music or I want to learn some uh, Star Wars music. The very first place I look is right here because he's got a ton of free resources of fun songs that kids want to play and then have the music accessible enough to play. So those links are really awesome. And uh, I asked whenever I found out uh, I was going to get to do this talk, I asked all of the other band and choir directors and or orchestra directors about their favorite tips to help kids practice. And here were some of their highlights. So uh, one director said fun pencils. If you put a fun pencil on your stand, the student's more likely to use it intentionally on their music to get, to make, make uh, corrections so they don't mess the same thing up twice, They're practicing efficiently. Uh, bringing a present to a concert or going to an after concert treat like ice cream is a huge motivator for some students and it might be something to try or finding all sorts of places for them to play is another great idea. Uh, so making what they're doing at home connect to something bigger and than themselves in their own practice, small practice session is one really cool thing you can do, uh, like playing at a church or a nursing home or playing with friends. Normalizing practice as an after school expectation, something I'm still still working on. Going for a treat after a week of consistent practice or somehow gamifying your practice sessions. And then getting involved as a parent in chaperoning concerts and trips and fundraisers brings the whole family in and makes it makes it kind of fun to do. Uh, my favorite tip of all, though, is asking lots of questions uh, when they're practicing. I mean, they want to impress you. So it'd be a great chance to be like, man, what you just did was super cool. What's that called? Or uh, if I was going to play that, what would I have to do? What is your mouth doing whenever you're making that sound on your instrument? Any, all that sort of, even if it's fake, all that curiosity is uh, just going to pay huge dividends into their own personal confidence in their horn and make, make them want to show off more for you. It's, it's going to be a win-win there. All right, so my email's here. I love answering questions about how students uh, can practice better or uh, if they want to help finding another way to practice because I learn every time I get to do it. So my email's there. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Rasky, our coordinator of fine arts. Uh, Amy Davis, Olivia Lawson, and Jessica Hamilton are all great directors in our district, along with lots of other ones, but they uh, directly uh, added some great ideas to this, uh, this presentation. But that's what I got for you today. So uh, yeah, so anything, any questions pop up or can I do anything else? Well, first and foremost, thank you, Jordan, for taking the time and, and really going through this. I mean, I enjoyed the video. I will say that. Oh, great. <laughs> um, but I think um, if you do have any questions, feel free to go ahead and use the Q&A um, and we'll we'll answer those. I don't see any right now. Um, but while we give uh, folks a minute or two, what we are going to do is after probably sometime tomorrow morning or sometime tomorrow, um, we will be sending out a survey. And then we will also include all of the links that Jordan had shared um, in his slide deck. Um, so you all can take a look at those at your leisure um, and bookmark them um, to help your, your students um, practice. Um, so I will, if there are no questions, you, you all are very welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. We're getting a lot of thank you uh, comments. Um, and so again, we have recorded this as well, so we can share the recording. Um, but if, if there are no questions, that will be a wrap. Thank you all. Thanks for coming.